Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I'll just ask everybody to put their um, themselves on mute other than Joanna. Um, and if you don't mind also just not running your camera because that might help us with the bandwidth. Um, it's very yeah, nice to see everyone's faces, but um, we are struggling a little bit sometimes with the, with the Wi-Fi. Um, so with that, I'll kick off. Uh, I wanted to uh, just introduce myself. My name is Chelsea Martin, as Chris mentioned, and I'm the Australian Consul General here in Los Angeles. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for this very special preview of the Fowler's upcoming exhibit, Aboriginal Screen Printed Textiles from Australia's Top End. Uh, the exhibit was due to open in October this year, uh, but has been postponed for, for very obvious reasons until February 2021. Uh, but this is something that has been uh, in the works for quite some time and is a very major undertaking. Um, and we were actually due to host a pre reception at my house uh, back in March, right on the cusp of the COVID pandemic breaking out. And a lot of you were invited to join us for that. So we thought we would take it virtual today. And uh, it's my pleasure to be joined by the curator of this incredible exhibit, Dr. Joanna Barkman. Joanna's back in Australia, so we are definitely keeping this very virtual right now. Uh, just a little bit of background for those of you who don't know, this will actually be the first major exhibit of Australian textile artists in the United States. And Joanna has curated a show which presents works from five extraordinary Aboriginal owned art centres in the Northern Territory. Uh, that's what we call the top end, hence the title uh, of the exhibit. So Joanna is the Fowler's senior curator of Southeast Asian and Pacific arts. She's also an Australian and has extensive experience curating and publishing work on Aboriginal cultures. Prior to joining the Fowler, she worked with cultural collections in Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, um, and I'm sure there's more that I've missed there, Joanna. So as you would expect, I was very, very happy when the Fowler recruited her here to Los Angeles um, only a couple of years ago, because it's really been a passion of mine while I've been here in Los Angeles to find ways to sort of really boost the engagement of American audiences with our Indigenous Australian culture and art. So without further ado, Joanna, I'm going to throw to you because I know that you've prepared an incredible uh, presentation for us. So why don't you go through that? Um, you've got some great images, so I know you're going to take over the screen. Um, and then afterwards we'll have a Q&A and I'm hoping we'll get lots of questions uh, from those listening in today. You can direct questions via the chat function um, and Chris is going to help us monitor those and I'm going to try to do that at the same time as speaking with you, Joanna. So without further ado, um, thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you, Chelsea, uh, for that lovely introduction and thank you very much for hosting this event. Um, and also I'd like to um, acknowledge, uh, well, welcome to everyone. Good evening to those in Los Angeles and good morning to those who are joining us in Australia. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that uh, we have uh, some members from Bupper or Women's Centre joining us today. Jessica Phillips, the manager, as well as Deborah Work. Kitchen Raylene Bonson from Man and Greta. So a particular hello to them. And also to acknowledge a couple of the art centres, other art centres couldn't join us today because they're on bush holidays up on the Tiwi Islands. Uh, and uh, so we hope they're having fun out on country. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Marla Burns, the director of the Fowler Museum, who has joined us today. Marla's been a great uh, supporter of the exhibition and um, it's lovely to have her joining us as well. So um, I'm going to share my screen now um, and take you through a little PowerPoint that I've prepared that gives a very uh, general overview to the exhibition. So let's go. Okay, I hope you can see that there. Um, so the exhibition uh, entitled Aboriginal Screen Printed Textiles from Australia's Top End is um, uh, scheduled now for February 2020, which is uh, really exciting in that um, we've been working over the past two years with five Aboriginal art centres, uh, which uh, Chelsea has mentioned. Now, let me see if I can get slide. Yeah. 
in collaboration with the five art centres, Tiwi Design, Jilamara Arts and Crafts Association, Inyalak Arts and Crafts Aboriginal Corporation, Bapura Women's Centre, and Meripan Arts Culture Language Incorporation. And here you can see an image of each of those five art centres in their respective communities. So as Chelsea mentioned, the top hand is this and then the very northern continent here. Uh, so it's a very remote part of Australia, in fact, uh, very close to Southeast Asia. And uh, here on this smaller map, which uh, highlights the top end region, the five uh, communities where the five art centres are based are highlighted. Uh, and we'll come back to those maps as we move through the exhibition. But that's really to help orientate those people that maybe are not so familiar with the region that we would call the top end, which is actually located in the um, territories of the Northern Territory of Australia. So just a little about screen printing uh, of textiles. It's a stencil process uh, whereby one or more stencils are used to build up an image. And in the exhibition, we have some works that are made from one stencil, two, three, four, up to five stencils. The technique uh, requires relatively simple equip equipment of a screen, a squeegee, the fabric, the ink and the tables. Um, often two printers, or more often than not for fabric lengths, two printers are required. Uh, you can see in the image there, uh, the women are reaching across the table. So two people, they push the squeegee between themselves, uh, drawing the ink across the screen or the mesh of the stencil. Um, often the designs are printed on cottons, cotton jersey, poplin, silks and linen. Linen, very popular. Uh, natural fibres, of course, being... Uh, for the tropics and the heat where the textiles are created. And also the cloths are then heat set there to permanently fix the ink to the textile. This um, image gives us a little uh, indication of how the designs are created into repeats. Uh, this um, photo on the right shows an image of a cut through where by the art and uh, has done has been cut and actually uh, meet up with itself if you want and create a seamless join once printed. Uh, and it's in this way that the screens are repeated down the length of the cloth, uh, creating a seamless uh, repeat design. In this image here, uh, we can see um, a beautiful work that's designed by Deborah Workich uh, of Wark, the Black Crow. It's a site that Deborah uh, is a custodian of. Um, and here we can see the way in which uh, Deb has created this image using four screens. And indeed, these are images of the transparencies that she's used to build up the design. And uh, in this instance, it's uh, printed with some um, gray ink, white ink, yellow ink, and then the dark gray ink to create this really um, incredible uh, representation using the technique also uh, uses on her other work uh, as a fine artist. The process of transferring designs onto screens uh, is primarily uh, done these days using a light sensitive photo emulsion process um, with exposure of the, the, the uh, image uh, to UV or sunlight, which is often the case in Aboriginal art centres. And this series of images, we see Raylene Miller, who's the coordinator of the studio at Gillamara Arts and Crafts, um, preparing a screen with photo emulsion, placing the design of a magpie goose uh, onto the screen, covering it, uh, taking it out into the sunlight. She, the ink where the drawing is um, protects the photo emulsion from the site and set. The rest of the photo emulsion is exposed to the sunlight and it does set. And so then when she washes the screen in the bottom image down here, uh, the unset photo emulsion disappears, thus creating the stencil. Uh, in this instance, Raylene's printing it uh, on a printing carousel um, on a larger screen that's usually placed on a table. 
and indeed here we can see the final um, print, which was actually done for uh, a funeral. Often uh, garments are created, particularly for funerals on the Tiwi Islands, to honour um, honor, uh, totems of the people that have passed away. Here we see um, uh, Ruben and Luke at Inulak Arts printing. We see the tables, the, the lengthy table that is used, and also the registration chocks along the edge, the registration rail here of the table. And these are the chocks here that help the printers to align the screen so that they can read screens print. The choice that it has to make is the use of the ground or the base cloth, uh, its colour, and then the inks that they're going to use. And so in this way, we can have uh, an, uh, um, a very extensive uh, range of what's called colourways in the creation of the textiles. So now I'd like to take you through the five art centres and just uh, show a couple of textiles from each of the art centres. The exhibition is organised primarily around these five art centres showing uh, approximately 12 textiles um, that each art has used over time, uh, along with um, other objects such as baskets, um, sculptures um, and um, paintings in some instance that help interpret the textile designs. The first of the five art centres is Tiwi Design, which was established in 69. And uh, they're celebrating 50 years of screen printing at Tiwi Design this year. And here we can see, so that they're based in Wurramiangu here on um, Bathurst Island. And here we can see uh, two of the women uh, preparing a smoking uh, ritual for, which welcomes guests to the Tiwi Islands in this instance. Uh, we can see the women are wearing screen printed skirts and we've got a beautiful video in the exhibition of uh, this um, Kura Murpuni welcome uh, ceremony that occurs on the Tiwi Islands. The, the Tiwi Islanders uh, were taught woodblock printing originally back in, six, in the late 60s, which led to screen printing. Uh, and the establishment of Tiwi design. And they were taught uh, woodblock printing because of their really strong traditions of sculpture. And you can see here, which is Tiwi to, to, to mark um, is where people are buried. And increasingly these poles over the years have been uh, also created as fine art objects and sculptures. And we see this beautiful design created by Bid Tangatulam um, back in 85 uh, of the Tutini poles. This is a single screen design, uh, which Tiwi designs, um, all of their designs are use one screen only. This design is a really stunning piece as well. Um, back in the early days, in the mid 70s, created by Daniel Munkara, and it um, exemplifies, or it's his rendition of the Kulama ceremony, an annual ceremony that occurred on the Tiwi Islands around February, March, at the end of the wet season, when the yams would come in. And it was, so it was a time of feast of uh, in young men. We're very pleased to have this uh, work in the exhibition on loan to us from our Tiwi Design Archive. And then this stunning more recent piece created by a very uh, esteemed artist um, from uh, Tiwi Design, uh, Jing Baptiste Apua Timi, uh, who, this is her beautiful rendition of Jilamara, the, um, the, the word that means patterning in Tiwi. That it, the tradition uh, that we have uh, primarily again for ceremony associated with mortuary practice and the painting of the body is believed to give uh, protection to malevolent spirits um, during this sensitive time when souls are making the transition to the afterlife and here we see this absolutely glorious uh, um, rendition of um, uh, Jilamara. The uh, screen here you can see has been repeated three times using one screen, but using this ombre um, printing technique where different coloured inks are placed on the screen and pulled uh, to create this very beautiful um, variation of colour. 
So the second art centre is Jilamara Arts and Crafts Association, located here at Millicarpity on beautiful Melville Island. Um, Jilamara is a, um, a really vibrant uh, art centre and they've had two, two periods of creating screen printed textiles. Most recently, uh, the art centre artists um, uh, gathered in 2018 and did a workshop during which they created 26 new designs for repeated textile lengths. And here we see this beautiful uh, design, Bush Medicine by Mary Elizabeth Maureen that was created during that time. Uh, they worked with uh, a non-Indigenous artist, Tim Grocott, to assist them in the development of these designs. Here is another beautiful work that came out of that uh, workshop uh, created by, again, another highly acclaimed uh, Australian Indigenous artist, Timothy Cook. Um, like many of the artists whose work is uh, presented in our screen print textile exhibition, many of them work as um, painters and sculptors. And Timothy certainly has um, been well exhibited in Australia and internationally. This is his rendition of Blamas here um, the dot uh, and the circle, which are the three sort of elements that are continuously reappear in the um, formation of Tiwi art. From the earlier period, I mentioned there were two periods of Jilamara arts production. Um, early on in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a period of two or three years where screen printing on silk, but using fiber reactive dyes was very popular. And using ink permeated the textiles. Um, and we see this really uh, glorious piece uh, that belongs to the collection of the South Australian Museum that was created in 1992. And what's interesting here is we see at this very early period of Jilamara Art's work, they were uh, returning to earlier bark paintings as sources for design inspiration. And these bark paintings uh, that are presented here on the slide uh, were acquired in the, uh, the 1954 by Charles Mountford during a National Geographic exp expedition to Melville Island. Um, in that early period at Jilamara as well, the artists then thought, well, if we can look at paintings from the South Australian Museum, we might as well look to our very own paintings. And that's exactly what Nancy Henry did when she replicated her own uh, beautiful on the right, which is at the Museum of Applied Sciences in Sydney. And then she replicated her own artwork into this magnificent uh, textile design. And we're very pleased uh, that these two works will be um, exhibited in the uh, exhibition at the Fowler Museum. The third art centre is Inyalak Arts and Crafts Aboriginal Corporation, located over here in Gumbalanya, on the very edge of uh, Kakadu National Park, a World Heritage Site, uh, renowned for its uh, both environmental and cultural significance to the world. Uh, in this region. Uh, we're really delighted to have this magnificent work uh, by Don Namanja. It shows the rainbow serpent. Um, Namanja has employed the rock or the hatching painting technique, which is uh, well known to this region, uh, in his depiction of the rainbow serpent. We have a beautiful video in the exhibition of this design being printed by Priscilla Badari, um, Selena Najwo and Lynn Najwo at Inyalak Arts. So uh, this is a really magnificent work that we acquired at a seven metre length. It's the longest uh, piece to be displayed in the exhibition. We also have this beautiful work which uh, references the rock art uh, imagery that's out the back of Inyalak, um, or out the back of Gumbalanya, apologies, uh, at Inyalak Hill. And uh, this rock art is a really um, incredible course. And we see them replicating much imagery uh, from the rock art galleries in their contemporary textile designs. And finally, from in your life, this beautiful piece uh, created by three, oh, three of the women artists who uh, tend to collaborate 
uh, in their designs and also tend to reference a lot of woven objects which the women have particular expertise in the creation of at, um, at Gumbalanya. And here we see a group of the women artists uh, wearing their beautifully screen printed uh, aprons uh, that they wear in their print studio. The fourth art centre, Bapra Women's Centre, uh, is located here at Manangrida. Manangrida is home uh, to 12 uh, Indigenous village groups and is the largest Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory. Uh, Bapra is an amazingly dynamic uh, centre, uh, doing lots of different activities, working toward the empowerment of women in Manangrida, and also servicing various outstations, which are small uh, communities where families and clan groups go and live in very, on, their, on their traditional lands uh, in very remote contexts. So Bapara has an outreach program to various homelands as well. Uh, we have beautiful works by Jennifer Workich, looking at uh, the freshwater uh, streams and riverways of the region and the sorts of um, food sources uh, they provide. Ebra Workich, uh, a, a leading artist at Bapara and at Manangrida Arts and Culture, um, has designed this beautiful uh, rendition of York York, the water spirit that resides in waterways and billabongs. And finally, we're very honoured to have work by Susan Marawar in the exhibition, uh, a very acclaimed senior artist uh, from the region. And uh, here we see Susan with her uh, beautiful uh, print of a fish trap uh, on, the, on the print table at Bapara Women's Centre. And the final arts centre is Meripan Arts, Culture and Language, located over here in Nayu, uh, near the Great Daly River. Uh, this very small community of about 400 people uh, is uh, more often than not flooded uh, as the banks of the river break, uh, usually in January or February each year. Uh, and so this area, the art of this area is very much inspired by the wetlands. Um, and we see this amazing work by Christina Yam in work with who um, are a bespoke printing studio in Sydney um, that print uh, some of these more sophisticated designs which includes five screens in this particular example. Another um, acclaimed artist from Meripan Arts is a senior artist Marita Sambono and in this instance uh, Marita has done this beautiful design called Dagum, which uh, is a rendition of a site for which she is the custodian. It's a, it's a hot spring site uh, and early steam from the hot springs is what Marita has in part um, captured in this beautiful um, design that she created back in 2013. So in addition to the uh, art centres uh, and the five sections of the exhibition. We also have um, uh, interlinking modules uh, that talk to broader themes uh, in the exhibition and about the history of uh, printing in the Northern Territory. Uh, we have also, we're very pleased to um, have developed a beautiful publication uh, that has uh, included or has incorporated contributions from over uh, 25 contributors, both um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous contributors, curators, arts workers, uh, and with essays from each of the five arts centres. So we're really uh, delighted that this uh, beautiful publication will also be uh, launched and uh, for the opening of the exhibition in February next year. And just to that end, by way of closing, I wanted to make mention that one of those modules in the exhibition really talks to the question of how um, these textiles are increasingly um, motivating a contemporary Indigenous uh, fashion industry in Australia. And um, we're very excited to um, be able to present 
uh, garments in the exhibition, uh, some of which come from publisher textiles that have done a beautiful range with Bapara and other designers that are working uh, with some of the textiles from different art centres. Uh, we also have um, a beautiful video that we'll show you later, showing some of that fashion and also talking a little bit in both the book and the exhibition about the use of textiles um, as decor and interior design. So I think at that point, I, um, I might leave it there for the time being. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joanna. Um, that's fascinating. Even I've, I've been discussing this with you for at least a year and, and just seeing those images really brings it to life. So um, we will throw to that video that you mentioned in a little bit because when I watched it last week and saw all of those textiles in action, um, it really, it's very exciting um, and it shows that the quality of, of multimedia you've got in the exhibit as well as, as the pieces themselves. I'm going to kick off with a few questions myself while we wait for um, people to start sending them through on the chat. So don't be shy. If you've got a question for Joanna, please um, type away and Chris is going to help us to moderate them. But I just wanted to ask about what inspired you to curate this, exhi this exhibition. And also, if you could reflect a little bit on why textile screen printing has grown so significantly in recent times and has become such an important um, contemporary Aboriginal art form. Um, I was, well, first of all, when I first arrived at the Fowler in 2017, the Fowler had recently completed an exhibition, African Print Fashion Now. And so this uh, really seemed like a good fit to follow on from that exhibition to look at contemporary Aboriginal screen printed textiles. The Fowler has a really strong tradition. We have strong collections of textiles from predominantly Southeast Asia and uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. So there really was a, uh, an opportunity, I guess, at the Fowler to investigate this phenomenon of Aboriginal screen printed textiles. Um, so I guess that was the first sort of um, building block. The other thing to say is having worked and lived in the Northern Territory for a couple of decades, I have had the um, good fortune of being able to observe these textiles um, emerge, if you want, over time. And I think it's often, it's a very underrepresented part of Aboriginal contemporary art, textile art. Um, however, it's really been the mainstay and in fact was the driving force behind the establishment of these five Aboriginal art centres that have then gone on to spawn these amazing uh, contributions to contemporary Aboriginal art. And I think, as I mentioned, Tiwi Design has been printing textiles for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, although we have had exhibitions that have looked to batik, for, for example, Indigenous um, batik and fabric design, uh, back in the 80s, the National Gallery of Victoria did um, a beautiful exhibition curated by Judith Ryan looking at um, batik cloth. We've seen the Utopia batiks come out of the Janet Holmes Court exhibition that have been exhibited extensively in Australia. However, there's really never been a, um, uh, a, an exhibition that's really taken a deep dive into this screen printing phenomenon. And so it just seemed really timely. I think the second part of your question, though, uh, is about um, uh, the uptake of Aboriginal screen printed textiles. They really have gained popularity in recent years. I think when the global financial economic crisis occurred, um, although prior to that time, of course, there were um, people um, aware of these textiles and um, collecting them and using them, wearing them. Uh, but around the time of the global financial economic crisis, I think uh, the, uh, the broader fine art market really took a big hit at that time. And all of a sudden people were looking to find what else they might be able to acquire that was more affordable. And so textiles really took, uh, really entered the market in a strong way at that time. Then alongside that, or since that time, we've seen the real development in Australia of Aboriginal art fairs, which do an amazing job of bringing contemporary Aboriginal art out into the public, directly available to people that want to collect, to, to purchase, and to enjoy and appreciate. Mm -hmm. So I really think that through a hot, those factors, 
the momentum has really picked up. And finally, to say, uh, increasingly, um, I think Indigenous people themselves recognise the role of the textiles in asserting their own identity into mainstream Australia. Increasingly, we see uptake in the contemporary fashion industry, both by Indigenous and non-Indigenous designers. And that's really exciting to see how Aboriginal people are taking such pride in these textiles. Young people are wanting to wear them, to assert who they are, their cultural identity as Indigenous people. And also non-Indigenous people are really interested to buy, wear, uh, have these beautiful textiles to show their, uh, I guess, appreciation of the incredibly rich rich and diverse Aboriginal cultures that we have uh, in Australia. So I think all those things are coming together to really create um, a strong platform for the continued increased production and continued production of these textiles. Great, thank you. We've got, a, we've got a ton of questions coming through. So while I pull them up and start weeding through them, one thing I just thought might be useful for, particularly for people who haven't had much exposure to Indigenous, Australian Indigenous art and culture, is to just, if you could explain a little bit about the role of the art centres. Because um, obviously you, you spoke about the five that you've been working with and there's clearly, you know, different types of work coming out, but it's a very, very unique, um, uh, structure in Australia and it would be great just to give a bit a little bit of background on that if you don't mind. Hmm. So art centres really uh, grew out of an Australian federal government initiative um, toward the end of the 60s uh, and going into the 70s. They began being funded in the early um, well in the early 70s they grew they also some uh, art centers also had support from different missions or churches uh, at, at different early stages of their development but overall the art center movement is a really amazing movement in Australia uh, it enables uh, art centers to be their places on community where Aboriginal artists um, live and work often very remote contexts and they're places where artists can come uh, to create work uh, and also for their work to be promoted and marketed out into the world. So it enables artists to, so art centres are very critical as part of maintaining cultural practices. Each art centre is, is, uh, varies from the other. No two art centres are alike. They're very much uh, the product of the communities in which they're located and they're managed by Indigenous um, management committees and, and often employ uh, non-Indigenous expertise as required and also a, a great source of uh, income uh, for Aboriginal artists on country. So they're really critical. They continue to be supported by uh, the federal government of Australia. And um, I think they've, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Many art centres, interestingly, grew out of adult education programs, particularly sewing programs, printing programs, that really were about um, thinking about how Indigenous people might begin to develop livelihoods on country back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the development of Aboriginal art was seen as a really valid um, option in terms of providing those sorts of livelihoods. The other thing to say was in the early 70s, uh, under the Gough Whitlam uh, Government of Australia, the Aboriginal Arts Board was also established, which continues today as part of the Australia Council. And the Aboriginal Arts Board actually developed one of the first exhibitions um, or funded one of the first exhibitions that toured into America back in, uh, I think it was 1978. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was called the Art of the First Australians. It was actually 76 to 78. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's a lot to be said about this infrastructure that has really gone on to enable this incredible contemporary art movement, not only in terms of textiles, but Australia actually, uh, Aboriginal artists and Torres Strait Islander artists uh, really are the um, custodians of one of the, of some of the most ancient cultures on the planet, uh, which informs this very contemporary art movement that really talks to the living experience and the living cultures um, of Indigenous people. So it's a pretty amazing um, achievement that these um, 
heart centres have been supporting. It's really important infrastructure. Great. Thank you very much. That's really helpful background for everyone. Um, I've got a question here that says, can you characterise the changes in the designs over time? And are the inspirations for designs moving beyond local cultural objects or places? Um, that's an interesting one. And I think in that I would add an, an overlay, um, which is, could you talk a little bit about the importance of, of um, place and, and animals and Indigenous Australians' relationship to their land in terms of the inspirations of their, of their works? Okay, well, I'll try and work, work through that. Um, I think there is, I think you do begin to see changes. Well, so first of all, I think it's one of the great uh, opportunities, I think, that our exhibition offers is the opportunity to compare and contrast different styles from the different uh, cultural groups. So if you look at the work of the um, artists from Bapara Women's Centre, for example, and contrast that with the Tiwi Designs work, you know, they're incredibly, they're informed by different cultures. They're informed by different types of material cultures. Uh, there's really different aesthetics at play uh, because they have different painting styles uh, that they're drawing mm -hmm. upon. So I think that's a really important point to, to make. Um, so over in Arnhem Land, we have the rat painting technique, which originally uses um, sedge grass brush uh, that's painted onto bark or other materials using natural ochres, hence the hatching and the rat technique. Over on the Tiwi Islands, um, there's the use of the lines, the circles and the dots, which um, inform the body painting techniques. So they're working from really different, um, very different techniques, different um, motifs, if you want, or design elements in the first instance. Um, over time, I think you can see variation at each art centre. I think there's definitely been a real um, increase in terms of technical skill that's become apparent. I think there's been a lot more innovation in terms of design um, in recent years. So whilst, um, and again, it varies from centre to centre, so it's a little hard to speak generally, but um, for example, looking at the work at Inyalak Arts, the men tend to, to really um, feature the rock work uh, very um, uh, strongly. I'm just checking that people can still, we're still all okay. I've, my screen has just um, flipped. <laughs> um, but just to continue there, um, I hope that we're, um, we're all connected still. But I think uh, at um, Inulak, we see the women who collaborate together they have a culture of working together through their weaving. Uh, they also do beautiful contemporary designs now of things like um, the cheeky dogs, the dogs that nip, nip your ankle when you walk down the street of a community. Uh, they're um, over in Maripan Arts, people, uh, people like Christina Yambing. Yambing did a beautiful design, it's really of a cartoon uh, that documents her memory of the 2015 flood when everyone was evacuated from the community. So I think that was really interesting, Yambing choosing to document a historical event in her mind. Uh, so I think there is a lot more um, uh, experimentation beginning to happen. But I also think what's interesting is I think there's a process of using the designs to pass on knowledge within the community. I think women in particular are documenting a lot of weaving techniques that they use in their basketry. You know, they're showing how objects are made uh, they're showing different knotting techniques, um, weaving methods, which are documented in the textile design so people can visually see them. So I think there's also this interesting process of passing on knowledge through a visual medium of the designs. So we see this um, increasing more and more. And finally to say, Different communities have also collaborated with other uh, non-Indigenous artists, be they printing technicians, be they um, design collaborative artists, textile artists. And I think also that exposes people to different ways of working and that increasingly there's a lot more, um, I guess there's um, more confidence in how people are working technically and with technical skill comes that ability to innovate further in terms of the aesthetics and the design elements.
So Joanna, the burning question is, will any of the beautiful fabrics be available for sale in the Fowler shop? Uh, we are working at the moment with the, uh, the five art centres to um, have uh, some textiles available uh, at the Fowler Museum when the exhibition is presented. Uh, in the publication, in the book that we've developed as well, we have a whole chapter that looks at the um, development of um, products around uh, the textiles, uh, which has been developed by uh, Felicity Wright, a long-term uh, player in the textile scene of the uh, Northern Territory and Central Australia. Um, and we see um, objects such as um, uh, things like purses being developed by Uru, uh, a great company based in Victoria. Um, so yes, there'll definitely be lots of uh, fun things to be discovered through the Fowler, the Fowler store. Great. So there's another question. Um, so with the contemporary fashion application of the designs, how are artists engaged in the garment design process and intellectual property ownership? I think that's, um, that's a really interesting question and it's actually a space where a lot more work is beginning to happen at the moment. Um, I think uh, each art centre is negotiating its own um, partnerships with different designers and I think that these are increasingly these partnerships are very collaborative. I think um, each art centre is very committed to retaining a level of control over how their textiles are being developed into garments and how they're being marketed. Uh, we see a really exa interesting example with Burrow Women's Centre collaborating with publisher designs in Sydney around the development of a garment range. So I think, you know, it's really interesting. It's a particular art centre working with a particular um, design group and uh, that uh, remains a really important issue for Aboriginal artists to retain control over how their artworks are being presented publicly. And just to that point, on a slightly different topic, uh, I just want to make the comment that in developing the exhibition and working closely with the uh, five art centres, we really wanted to collaborate with them in a way that was meaningful. And to that end, we hosted a curatorium in Darwin last year with the five art centres with representatives attending. And we um, invited the artists to uh, help us uh, think through how we're going to display the works, how we're going to interpret the works. And that in and of itself was a really great process for the artists themselves to come together and share information and knowledge with one another about this, their screen printed textiles. So um, I think it's really important and I think the fashion sector is increasingly having to learn in a way how to work uh, slowly and in a considered manner by consulting with Aboriginal artists and art centres as this fashion sector uh, really begins to gain momentum. Hi, Joanna. Great. Sorry, I jumped. I fell off there for a minute. My Wi-Fi completely disappeared. So uh, I'm sorry. I think I missed two questions. So if I am about to ask you something you've already answered, just uh, ignore me and tell me to go on to the next one. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your experience to date of American audiences and their reaction um, to Indigenous art. Um, from the consulate's perspective, we've been so uh, excited to see the Fowler really uh, focus on Indigenous Australian works. Firstly, with this, with your exhibit that's coming up now, the screen printed textiles, but then uh, further down the track in 2021, the Marayin Bark paintings, which is another major project, um, which I'm so pleased that the Fowler is also going to exhibit. Um, and people might have noticed that uh, during your presentation, it was obvious that the Fowler has actually acquired quite a number of the works um, that you're going to be showing, which I have to say thank you, Marla, for, your, for that investment of, and the Fowler support. But do you think that there is a growing interest and appreciation uh, for Australian Indigenous art in the US? And what has been... Um, your experience uh, in terms of bringing these types of works to your colleagues uh, at the Fowler, but also others that you've been that you've been liaising with as you bring this project together. 
It's a great question. Um, look, what I've discovered is every time I've uh, returned from a field trip or there's been a box of textiles arrive at the Fowler Museum and my colleagues in registration and our collection managers who work really hard caring for our collections have um, unpacked the textiles, people are simply blown away. And um, that has repeatedly been the experience of showing people the textiles um, as we've been working on developing the exhibition. So I think the work is really strong in terms of the textiles and people are going to be really impressed when to see it all uh, en masse, if you want, in the exhibition. And to that point, I would just like to thank the Fowler Textile Council, which have supported the acquisition of over 55 textiles. Um, so we've really got an amazing collection now at the Fowler um, for this exhibition. Um, the Fowler is really well placed to host this exhibition, having worked with other Indigenous communities doing uh, exhibitions, looking at um, Maori uh, cultural material back in 2013-14, also with Tongva peoples, uh, looking at maritime uh, traditions back in 2011, Tongva people being the Indigenous people of the Los Angeles base basin and also hosting the icons of the desert uh, early uh, aboriginal paintings from papunya back in 2009 so we are sort of i guess fat, the fowler in and of itself is really um, has a commitment to working with indigenous communities around the presentation of their material culture and their art um, and then you mentioned of course um Klugi Roo, which is um, an, uh, the only ab dedicated Aboriginal art collection uh, in America, which is doing fabulous work, a really active ex exhibition program and residency program, which is wonderful. And of course, you mentioned Mother Yin, which is going to be touring uh, in the States, uh, I think now in 2022. Uh, featuring work, a series of bark paintings um, and the develop, really looking at the development of bark painting uh, from in the, in the East Arnhem Land region, uh, working with Buku Larangay Art Centre. Uh, so we're really excited to, for the possibility of hosting that exhibition. Coming back to your earlier part of the question though, I think, you know, it's been, a, it, I think there has been, as I mentioned, there's been exhibition, really major exhibitions coming to the state since the 70s of Aboriginal art. Um, the Dreamings, the Art of Aboriginal Australia was uh, in New York and uh, Chicago and Los Angeles at LACMA back in 1988-90. Uh, then, um, as I mentioned, the icons of the desert happened. But I think more recently, since like in 2009 was a really big year, I was really delighted to see um, contemporary Aboriginal art on display at Freeze in Los Angeles last year. Uh, there was, um, uh, I think, uh, Sotheby's hosted their first dedicated Aboriginal art auction in America last year. Uh, so that's sort of showing a real interest um, from the market. Um, but also I think importantly, private collections have played an important part in the way in which they're being presented in the States. People like Dennis and Deborah Skoll have got an extraordinary collection. They've been very generous in their benefaction to places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, uh, the Florida University, uh, the Nevada uh, Museum of Art, which all have hosted contemporary Aboriginal art exhibitions. And then of course, we've had the Steve Martin and uh, Anne Springfield collection of contemporary Ab Aboriginal art um, presented re recently by Gagosian in New York and Los Angeles. So these are all really, um, all of these events are really contributing to this being a very important moment for uh, American audiences to engage more. I think there's a real appreciation that this is living, uh, th th that it's appreciated as art for, for its own sake. It's not necessarily, there's no need to look at uh, art, this, these amazing artworks in some sort of ethnographic lens anymore. I think people really are appreciating the incredible vibrancy and uniqueness of, um, of Aboriginal art. Uh, and I think the States is really um, just catching on to something maybe that we've had this really uh, great opportunity to um, 
well, I can only speak for myself in this regard, a great opportunity to live alongside and to observe uh, as it has just gone from strength to strength. And I think it really points to the great resilience of Indigenous Australians mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, they really, in, even in Australia uh, in the 60s, I think it was very rare to see uh, Aboriginal art presented as art, it was always um, put in some sort of ethnographic uh, category. And so in that period of time, I think there's been this incredible um, uh, uh, breaking, if you want, of a glass ceiling. It really is amazing art and it stands in and of its own right, you know, in that category. And I think that's really what Americans are beginning or the US audience is beginning to appreciate as well. That's great. Now we are almost out of time. I can't believe it's flown by so quickly. Um, and I want to save a little bit of time to, to close with that fantastic video, which really speaks to what you're talking about with the vibrancy um, and just how exciting it is right now around um, the textiles and, and that as a contemporary uh, Aboriginal art form. But before we wrap up um, and I say a few thank yous, I know that you, I mean, this I hope has given everyone a little taste of, of what is to come in February, but you also have in the works, besides this incredible uh, exhibition and the multimedia aspects of it and the book that you already spoke about, you've got other programming that is already in train. Do you just want to speak very quickly about that so that people have an idea of what's to come? We're really thrilled that the Australia Council for the Arts, the Aboriginal Arts Board, has uh, contributed uh, to the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair to assist them to bring over six Indigenous artists uh, to be part of the exhibition and public programming. So that um, there's a range of programs that are being developed. I won't go into too much detail about those, but definitely there'll be uh, a very active uh, program of public programs being delivered by the Fowler with artists um, early next year. So um, yeah, please keep keep abreast of those developments via the um, the Fowler's website. Okay, well, thank you so much, Joanna, for this incredible sneak peek. I can see from the messages coming through that there are a lot of people who are very excited about it. Um, you know, this is clearly a very ambitious project uh, that you and the Fowler have undertaken. And I know that the Fowler always welcomes support um, for these and other projects. And I just wanted to point out that um, if people uh, were interested in finding out more about this or in finding out ways that they can support uh, this project or other projects underway with the Fowler, but particularly this one we're focusing on today, um, please uh, contact Chris Lewis. And Chris, I think, is going to put up her details right now. Gee, that was seamless. Well done. Um, so those are Chris's details, and I believe that they uh, we can put them up again at the end. But I just wanted to express my personal thanks to Joanna um, for all the work that she's done in collaboration with the consulate uh, since she's been here, but also to Marla. Um, you have an incredible team, Marla, and uh, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with you. So the consulate is very lucky to have this exhibit and then uh, the Monday in with the Cookie Room coming up as well, hopefully on show there, as you say, in 2022. But before we sign off, Joanna, just give us a little intro um, to this video we're about to see. It's one of seven uh, that will be part of the exhibit. But as I mentioned, represent, we were really... Uh, uh, determined to have Indigenous voices in the exhibition and to that end we've created seven short videos. Um, five come from each of the art centres and look to a particular aspect of their um, designing processes or their cultural activities. However, we also have an, uh, a beautiful um, video created uh, in partnership with the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair who host the fashion event every year, uh, originally created by Grace Lillian Lee, a Torres Strait Islander artist and fashion designer, and it's called From Country to Couture. And so this video, which will be presented in the exhibition uh, with footage from From Country to Couture, uh, from several years of that exhibition, uh, that fashion parade that's held in Darwin every year as part of the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair. Great, thank you, Joanna. And Chris has just reminded me that for anyone who had questions that weren't answered, uh, that we didn't get to today, um, please also uh, follow up with Chris 
on that email that we showed you before, because I'm sure Joanna would be more than happy to come back to you all um, separately. So thank you. So without further ado, thank you so much and let's wrap with the video. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Joanna. Look forward to having you back in LA soon. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Chelsea. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Joanna.